this is called to preserve um, to preserve value. It's it's a bleak poem. One of the things about writing about climate change, as much as possible, to avoid the doom and gloom of it all, despite its truth. Because if you start from if you start having lost, there's kind of like no room to maneuver. But um, this is a little doom and gloomish. Um, it's called to preserve value. This is to do with sustainability and money, and I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm very tempted to show how this is linked to some of the previous poems, but that is just anal. And no, I'm gonna read the poem to preserve value. The last poems of the West will be cast in gold, the size of a golf ball, letters stamped in Times New Roman and shoved in a stuffed and stuffed in a dead girl's mouth. She might be the teacher's daughter. He will hold vigil once a week, whisper to her shallow mound news of global poverty, a soullessness growing, and the book of Psalms. Centuries pass, wealth fades, knowledge dominates trade. The archaeologist who dust her teeth will catch the yellow glint beneath and read her soul back to life and give to us what's free. Thank you. I think I started writing poems that were linked with climate change or about the subject matter tangentially um, in 2005 when I started spending lots of time walking through the city on my own and just noticing the effect that had on my person and just in the way I thought about myself. and. Also, when um, the human population kind of switched and more than 50% of us now live in the cities, and apparently biodiversity uh, in cities is growing at an alarming age faster than it's actually decreasing um, in the rural areas, which is quite alarming to think about. Um, um, they did a study in the New York subway and they took DNA swabs just for wiping down the chairs, et cetera. Some like 20% of the DNA swabbed, they had no clue what it was. Like, it wasn't human, it was, they had nothing on the record for it. Just nothing, so whether we had, you know, we had metamorphosized or we had evolved or many black is real, I have no idea. Um, but it just made me just aware of how things, anyway, I wrote this little poem called Glass, Glass Xylophones and Vastness, which attempts to show how linked we are, regardless of if we know so or not. Here goes. <coughs> Glass xylophones and vastness. I met a girl who met a guy from South Dakota who likes the thin clash of teaspoon on glass. With varying sizes, she'd hazard a glass xylophone and last Christmas played a melody so delicate, fairy lights blinked enchanted by its rhythm. Imagine that, an entire constellation dancing to her prancing hands, pinkies poised like tuning forks. Perhaps this came the world. A deity in darkness knocks together rocks. The aftershock and echo rocked clouds of matter, danced them human form, and we are still enchanted, lights blinking on. The guy who met that girl dives once a month, down by the jetty where the sea spray sings. He dives, not for the thick tide swooping over rocks, not for the rock soft lullaby of waves, not for the seagulls diving brave past the breakwater, not for the scrolling gale. He dives beneath the surface, arms out wide and drifts to fill one with the vastness of it all. The girl I met who met that guy is the crux of it all. You have to see her take the stage, voice husky, small. Have to see her chest fall. Have to hear her note shudder. Gotta hear her tongue flutter the folklore of his name. The audience hush like loosened waves. Guitars, strums, rain. Flute feigns the scrolling gale. Hi-hats like xylophones clash us through the vastness in which we dive, which we stage. We tap out the rhythm, rage and dance and while and age till its enchantment tells our wage that each light one day blinks off. So a few years ago, I, was, um, I made this into a film, which is a long poem um, called Pandemonium, and you can find the footage on, on YouTube. And um, this, yeah, this is kind of a little bit playful, but then gets serious. Um, here goes, Pandemonium. All is quiet. 
My room is a white canvas freshly drawn on. The grass is just pencil sketches and her words are 40 shades of green. Her metaphors are emerald, similes are neon. Adjectives are kaleidoscope of mostly monotone imaginings. I knee on pillows that in her presence become tree stumps. The bedroom is all farmland and I am top sheepdog. I cock my leg and pee on tree stumps. My poetry meets root. Tree stumps begin to blossom. I yelp like a puppy bitten by possums, run behind the headboard and watch things unfold. She lying on the bed is never whole. She's dissipated, a thousand blades of tall grass. She's a million leaves, a handful of hibiscus petals. She's oak bark and acorn seeds. I bark, my breath becomes breeze twisted and she, petals shifting. A small storm cloud appears out of nowhere. I switch the light on and off, enticing a thunder strikes, followed by rain. She reacts to the weather. I am the weather vane. I am this metal melting. I am a ghetto boy, made bashful, beholding her beauty unfolding. She is an Iliad of bromeliads and bows. The concave of her belly is the Amazon's river bowl. Her arms are savannas and white plains. I nosedive from them into the deep soft between her grand canyons. It is my favorite part. She trembles. She starts. High in our troposphere, a snowstorm starts. She sees that this room will not contain us, moves the desert of her foot towards the door. I am the skier in the blizzard on her back. We avalanche past the flights of stairs together. Her shoulder bones a mountain range, her spine is a glacier. She burst out the front door, teeming with crazy flora, vines and wild beasts, leaving spinning on the top step in a crystal glass, a mixture of refined molasses, beetle berry, and Australian amaryllis marinated in new rain and I am certain as a truth seeker haven't burned the book of lies I am certain as I toast after her certain that everything will change from now on pineapples will grow from street lamps that light filtered through fruit starts a new trend in nutrients from now on phone boxes will be greenhouses and in them lilies will blossom every time a loved one is called from now on, power lines will be replaced by vines and cities will run on photosynthesis. Traffic cones will be tree stumps, pavements will be streams. From now on, cluster bombs will be filled with seeds that the falling sound of one simply signifies a future harvest feed. I am joyous, caught in this instance of reed growth through crazy pavement and rippling puddles of mead. Then the sky darkens grass recedes. I see a bold mist in the distance, a pandemonious haze of jade hues rustling. The carbon smog gets bigger. I dive across the front porch as it blasts through the front door, landslides up the stairs. I climb this crumbling gradient of an inner leg, but forests fire me. I attempt to hurry across her thigh, but cane senseless. I am tidal wave to her now barren belly, tornado twisted to melting snow caps and thawing spine. I turn her over, returned and deformed, she's held together by withering vines. Her arms are sun-baked, her pupils are oil spills. She cries black tears that poison lakes. I am the swan swimming in it, I'll pawn my wings for my friend's sake. She's fading around me. Her shivers are earthquakes, the bedroom is a graveyard. Her words are forty shades of grey. All this quiet once again save the rising sound of passing emeralds, the havoc of hurricanes, and she, my fading friend. Lost one. <laughs> um, this was um, commissioned recently by the Welcome, um, by the Welcome Collection. Um, and we had to, this, the, the UN are celebrating the International Year of Light, and I'm doing a, one or two um, events for them scattered, well, actually five, six events for them scattered across the world. And um, I was commissioned to write this tiny poem um, where I was given set words which were different types of light and have to, had to weave them into a narrative. So this is, this is just called light poem number one. I'm gonna end up writing like a hundred of these. Um, oh yeah, um, my name is Inua, which is a deity in Inuit mythology. Um, and when I discovered that a whole nation of people worshiped me, um, I told my twin sister 
And having been there when I was conceived, she knew that I was entirely human and just slapped me to prove the point. Um, so this poem, yeah, I just, I just refer to the Inuit. The ice-like clarity Inuits enjoy of their native skies. The way it gathers up the natural soft of snow-reflected light into its wide self holds it up to frame stars long after rays retire isn't cherished or sought out by us urban dwelling folk who by oil or alcohol lamps carved our own stars from glass, sowed in them electric seeds, steel nuclei to burn, granting us luminescence, these egg-sized supernovas trapped in lamplights, I choose to free now, flick the switch, draw close the blinds, unplug the artificial for a miner's light, a lone candle, flame blinking in the dark, and search my native self for anything shimmering. Thank you. Um, two more poems. So um, this is called Gorilla Garden Writing Poem. Um, there's a project I do um, um, called The Midnight Run, where I gather complete strangers and we play through the streets of a city from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And it's 12 hours where we walk and we eat, we play basketball, we write poetry, we create song and theater and dance. And um, I'm doing, so I'm doing five midnight runs. Um, one, the London is on the 18th of July and the others happen in Berlin, Paris, Rome, and Madrid, and these all fall under the bracket of the International Year of Light. So I'm creating poetry workshops around light to teach. And one of the things we engage with is light pollution and how this is symbolic of, um, of, of global warming and of climate change. And um, I think of, and what one thing I do in the Midnight Run is I invite artists and, and activists to come and to share their crafts and their practices with us, the Midnight Runners. And I once worked with um, a gorilla gardener. And these are gardeners who tend patches of green in the city. And um, once, about three, four years ago, there were 30 of us on our hands and knees planting daffodils into a traffic island just in Blackfires. Um, yeah, at about 3 a.m. in the morning. And it was glorious and tiring. And um, three police squad cars pulled up and we just gave them flowers and they drove off into the sunset. It was brilliant. Um, so this poem is dedicated to the gorilla gardeners. Um, yeah, but I, also, I think of poets as the gorilla gardeners of language, you know? Um, and I think of gorilla gardeners as people who see the rules of cities and how immense and sprawling it is, despite all the pollution and all the, you know, the stop signs. And their job are to find little islands where they can break the rules and create beautiful things. And I think of poets as being tasked to do so, that language is this sprawling mess of rules and regulations. And, um, and poets break the rules. And people want us to do so much, they give us a license to do so, hence the poetic license. So this, this poem is called Gorilla Garden Writing Poem, where I try to merge those two things together. Here goes. The mouth of the city is tongued with tar. Its glands gutter saliva, teeth chatter in rail clatter, throat echoes, car horns and tires screech. Forging new language, a brick city smoke speak of stainless steel continent and suffocated vowels. These are trees and shrubbery, the clustered flora battling all hours, the cattle staggered through streets. Meet Rich and Eleanor on Brabourne Grove as he wrestles her wheelbarrow over cobblestones to the traffic island by Quito Road, where this night colored a, a, a turquoise grit. Cathedral quiet and saintly makes prayer of their whispers and ritual of their work, bend over, clear rubble, cut weed and plant. But more than seeds are sown here. You can tell by his tender patch and tended patch, the soft cuff to a boy's head, first day to school. But how the rest with parent pride against stone walls, huff into winter's cold. Press faces together as though two lips might stem from two lips. Gather spades, forks, wheat, and go. Rich wheelbarrows back to Eleanor's as vowels flower of flowers vowel through smoke speak. The soil softens, the city drenched with new language thrills, and the drains are drunk with dreams. The sky sways on the safe side of tipsy. 
and it's altogether an alien time of half-life and hope, an after-fight of gentle fog and city smog, where the debris of dew drips to this narrative of progress, this city tale, this story is my story, this vista my song. I too cluster in the quiet, stack against steel, seek islands, hope, and a pen to sew with. Thank you for listening to me. Um, um, and this is the last poem. It's called Directions. Also about going for a walk in a city, but thinking about how the smog and, and the gases in the air affect the human body. Um, so thanks for listening. I have copies of these books if you want. They only cost four pounds. And um, this is called Directions. Thank you. You know the wild bush at the back of the flat? The one that scrapes the kitchen window? The one that struggles for soil and water and fails where the train tracks scar the ground. You know how even leave the bush and walk this tunted land, you come to crossroads paved just weeks ago, hot tar over the flattened roots of trees, and a squad of traffic lights, red-eyed now, stiff against the filth-stained fallen leaves. And further on, you know the bruised allotment with the broken sheds? And if you go beyond that, you hit the first block of Thomas Street Estate. Well, if you enter and ascend, and you might need a running jump over dank puddles into the shaking lift that goes no further than the fourth floor, you'll eventually come to a rough rise of stairs and reach without railings the rundown roof as high as you can go and a good place to stop. The best time is late evening when the moon fights through drifts of fumes as you're walking. And when you find an upturned bin to sit on, you'll be able to see the smog pour across the city and blur the shapes and tones of things. And you will be attacked by a symphony of tires, airplanes, sirens, screams, and engines. And if this is your day, you might even catch a car chase or hear a horde of biker boys thunder across the bridge. But it is tough to speak these things. How tufts of smog enter the body and begin to wind us down. How the city chokes us painfully against this chest carved of secrets and fire. How we, built of weaker things, regard our sculpted landscapes, water flowing through pipes, the clicks of satellites passing over clouds, and roofs where we stand in a shudder of progress, giving ourselves to the vast outsides. Still, text me before you set out. Knock when you reach my door, and I will walk you as far as the train tracks with water for your travels and a hug. I will watch after you and not turn back to the flat till you merge with the throngs of buses and cyclists heading down towards the block, scuffing the ground with your feet. Thank you.